Jesus. Amen. Man, what a beautiful day outside. What a beautiful group inside. So good to see you today. Glad you're here to worship with us. Exciting service today. I tell you, I believe the Lord is already up to work in hearts and lives. Had a great service over at our Magnolia campus. Uh, tonight, by the way, if you are invited if you so desire to drive all the way across town. I'm going to. I'm kind of used to driving all the way across town. <laughs> But I'll be doing a missions conference at the San Felipe Baptist Association. And you are invited. It starts at 5 o'clock. There'll be a great worship set from a group over in Cadia Church there. Uh, El Buen, uh, El Pastor, I'm not sure the exact name of the church, but it's in your bulletin. I know how to get there. It starts at 5. You're invited, if you come, to stick around after the worship and, and preaching time. So I'll be speaking to share an authentic uh, Mexican food dinner served by the church. So uh, they're looking forward to serving folks that will be there in the worship, uh, for the worship and then sticking around for dinner afterwards. So 5 o'clock we start, and then following that we have fellowship dinner together. So you're invited to come be a part of that. Love to have you there. I'll be talking uh, to this particular Baptist Association. It's one that we're looking at joining forces with in the near future, as a matter of fact, for our, our missions outreach and things that we do on, on a state and national as well as a global level. So uh, always looking to partner with people that are doing stuff for Jesus. Amen. Uh, this is the association that Perry Eaton also works with, with Ron and Perry. They'll be going with us, and I'll be going with them as we go to Cuba in the later part of the month. But we're glad that you're here. I want to talk to you about thriving. In fact, we've been talking about the life Folks that don't just survive but thrive and abundant living. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and put it in my common X, and that life you could thrive in it. I mean, it would be a life abundant and a life that's full. You don't have to look around to see today. There's not a whole lot of Christians that are living on that particular level. We, we sing about it and we talk about it. Uh, we express, we know the verses in the Bible that talk about this super abundant living. But most Christians that I know, I'm not talking about you generally because this is probably the most vibrant group I do know, but a lot of Christians I know are just eking out a living. They're just getting by. They're getting through life. How you doing? Oh, I'm okay. You know, there's no abundant, abounding joy coming out of their mouth. They're just surviving. Uh, that's not what God wants. God wants you as a living testimony of what full life is about and what bountiful living is really all about. So I'm only talking about thriving. This is our third message in this four-part series. But I don't think you can do honestly a favor to the Word of God and be honest with the Word of God and honest with the church of the Lord Jesus Christ if you don't talk about stewardship in the context of thriving. All right? What do I mean by stewardship? I mean, it's people that realize, you know, that the Lord has blessed them and they're responsible for the things that God has given them. And so the title of this is not just Thrive, part three is Give to Live. All right, if you're not giving, you ain't living. People kind of fall into one or two categories in life. They're the leaners, all right, or the lifters. Which are you? <laughs> are you just kind of leaning on others, or are you lifting others? We all fall into that. We're, we're, we're either the takers and the getters, or we're the givers. If you follow the life of Christ and you look at our Heavenly Father, for God so loved the world that he did what? God wants us to be like him. The Bible says, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In other words, to be like him, to be a righteous person. Can't be a righteous person if that character quality of being a giver is not in your life. But that's a, that's a part and lesson that so few people really want to hear a message about, you know. In fact, they say, I just don't want to go to church because I don't want to hear the preacher talk about. But it goes much deeper than money, all right? That's just, the Bible talks about that a whole lot. And if you start following what the scriptures have to say about it, it's, it's alarming on so many levels. And if you go to your concordance in the New King James Bible, it uses this, I mean, there's like 277 verses that talk about faith, all right, in the New Testament. And if you go and you look up the word prayer, there's about 340 verses on that. If you look at love, there's 518 verses dealing with love in the New Testament. What about, what about giving? 1,439. In fact, it's phenomenal if you start studying the Scriptures. Half of the parables in the Gospels, half of the parables deal with learning how to be a steward before the Lord, that you manage what the Lord has given you. Just look in the, in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark and Luke. One out of every six verses in the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke have to do with giving, being a steward. And even the Sermon on the Mount where we talk about forgiveness and being a servant heart. That, that's giving. I mean, even to forgive somebody is giving. It's costing you when you forgive, right? It's costing you in the context of your emotions or your personal pains or hurt. It's all about giving. Our life 
focuses around that, that we literally become this, this center of distribution. Jesus spoke more about this topic than he did about heaven or about hell. All you got to do is read your Bible. Someone told me about 56% of all divorces kind of come up over this issue about giving and money. Why does the Bible have to say so much about it? Well, I think pretty simple if you take a look back at the elemental principles we learn as Christians that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have a sin nature, all right? And the essence of that sin nature is just self. We're just selfish by nature. Nobody has to teach us how to be selfish. You know, we're just selfish. You didn't have to teach your children to fight over the toys. They just naturally did it. I mean, the first words out of their mouth are mine. You know, <laughs> it's mine. It's I, me, mine. This is what I want. It just things ultimately tend to, to manage our life. Really get these two things down here. If you study the scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament, you find out two real important principles, you know, in, in the word of God. All right. The first principle of give to live is you got to know that God really does own everything. That's more than a nice Bible verse. I mean, everybody knows that. We say it, at least everybody in church knows that. Who owns everything? God owns everything. What's, who's the earth belong to? How about the cattle on a thousand hills? Who owns the thousand hills? Who owns the oil underneath the hills? <laughs> God owns, and you may think it's Exxon or HP or, no, God owns everything. Now we gladly say that and we volunteer that information. But do we really believe that? I mean, we talk about my car, my house, my clothes, my shoes, my this, my bank, my savings, my 401. A lot of my in there, isn't it? But whose is it? It's really God's. Well, what am I supposed to do? Well, the second principle you've got to catch here is that God, you know, he's called you to manage it. We used a good, good old word in, in, in church growing up when I was a kid. We called it stewardship. You know, that's a good word. Most people don't know it today. It basically means management. All right? How many of you work for somebody here today? You work for a company, you work for an individual. I mean, you might not necessarily self-employed, all right? And even when you're self-employed, you're really still God-employed, all right? He lets you do what you're doing. But you're, you, you may be in a role, and I don't care what subordinate role to the boss you're in, you're still in, in, in responsibility of stewardship. You're managing whatever area you're working in. That's your responsibility, and you have to give an account for doing that, all right? So that's your part, your portion your parcel that you're supposed to take care of so what does it mean everything i have comes from the lord what am i supposed to do? i'm supposed to manage it and interestingly enough god tells us how to do that but unfortunately so few people have taken the time to really look at it in fact when you mention giving most times in churches uh buttons start hitting you know mute and mental the mental mute button goes on i, I really don't want to hear this you know or i've heard this before but i'd really just appreciate it if everybody here just kind of Undo the mute button. And let's have a teachable moment today. And even if it's something you've heard before and you know it, let's rehear it. The Apostle Peter said, I want to stir up your minds by way of remembrance. So was, I'm going to remind you about this. In fact, it's every preacher's responsibility to constantly be reminding the body of Christ and the sheep of biblical principles. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible teach? Are we staying true? Are we honoring God? Are we being faithful to what God has given us and what God has taught us? There is a tendency, as we've said in the last few weeks, you know, towards the, towards the selfish part of our lives instead of the spiritual part of our lives. So it is something we should often be reminded of. In every area of our spiritual life, we need reminding. We need somebody to give us a little poke and say, hey, remember what the Bible says. Remember what God teaches us. Remember about the spirit-filled life. Or we become just self-centered. You know, we become that grumpy old grumbly person. I heard about, you know, the missionary was speaking at a conference like we'll be going to tonight, you know. That, and, but they, were, they had the mission, a missionary speaking there. And so everybody's listening to the message. And as he wraps up his message, it's obvious they're going to take an offering for that particular mission need that he's presenting. I don't know if they're going to be taking an offering tonight or not. All right. But I'm talking about in this particular illustration. So... The time comes, and it's the traditional, you know, Baptist way of doing things, which we're not always doing stuff real traditionally around here. But the ushers come forward with the plates or the buckets or the bags or whatever it is, right? And so they come to the Ford, and they're making their way back. But about three or four rows back, there's this guy with his arms crossed, and he is Mr. Grumpy. He's not going to be moved, you know. His theme songs, I shall not be moved, you know. He's not. He's probably there because his wife made him come. He's not a happy camper. He's got a scowl on his face. And so the usher comes by with the plate and holds it under his nose there a little bit. And the guy just shakes his head. 
And the usher kind of whispers to him, well, sir, you know, it's, it's for missions. And he just, you know, he said, uh, mm-mm. He shakes his head, a little scowl, mumbles a sentence. I don't believe in him, is what he says. So the, the usher kind of looks at the man and leans down and says, then, sir, I suggest you take something out because it's for the heathen anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> so maybe we'll do that today if we pass on, but we don't pass the plate. You get to worship by actually taking your gifts to the, to, to the, to the offering receptacles. There's, there's a couple chapters. That for people, I always say, well, I just, they, they're kind of uninformed in this area, or maybe they're young in the Lord, or they just don't want to go this route and talk about these things called money. You know, they just want to deal with it. But if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 or chapter 9, there's two fabulous chapters where Paul is teaching the church about the importance of giving. And the Bible has a lot to say about this. This is nothing new, all right? Jesus had a lot to say about it. And here's two whole chapters that just deal with it. We're going to kind of hit a few verses through there, but I encourage you to take some time on your own, make a little devotional read yourself, and look at it. The first principle we learn from these chapters, second eight, chapters 8 and 9, is that, hey, you know, God owns it all. You've been called to manage it. How hard is that, all right? But with anything I've been called to manage, I need to know how to manage it properly, all right? We're put in charge to manage things. If I don't manage things, you know what happens? Things manage me, all right? Have you ever noticed that even on your work life? <laughs> if you don't take charge and manage the things that you're called to manage, those things will start managing you, and then everything gets convoluted and out of order. But the fact that we have to understand is that once we become Christians, our character should be that of Christ we are followers of Christ. Jesus is a giver. The Father's a giver. He so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. He wants us to be givers. The Bible says, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So you understand that God himself is this incredible giver of life, giver of hope, giver of grace, giver of peace, giver of joy. Amen. But he's interested in how we give. But I think it's more interesting. he's more interested in us in why we give. You know, what are our motivations? What should it be? Or do we have motivations for giving? Maybe we have motivations for not giving. But one thing we learn from Scripture in these passages is attitude matters, all right? It's important. Giving, once you study the Scriptures, we find that the giving is not so much a responsibility. And that's the way most people approach it. Well, it's my responsibility. The more you understand giving, the more you see it's an opportunity for what God does and how God moves and how God works in your life is a result of your faithfulness, all right? So it's, it's important you understand why we should give. And, and then we begin to understand the why and what our motives are. I think it helps us understand and to see the full scope of what God is trying to teach us when it comes to these principles. We don't talk a lot about money right here. The offering is usually a very brief mention. We don't even pass a plate around here. When it comes to taking offerings for special events like missions, we just tell people, you go pray. You hear from God. You see God's face about what you're supposed to give. We don't try to come up and share a bunch of sob stories or show sad little pictures, you know, of the children or someone suffering. Hey, you should be, you should be in tune with the Holy Spirit in your life. You should be asking God, how do I give? How do I honor you? It's not a bunch of rules and regulations, but you do want to realize that God imposed these things upon us for a reason, not because God's poor. Who owns everything? God ain't poor, all right? God owns all the gold in the banks and all the gold in the mountains that are still there, all right? God is so rich, he paves his street with gold. Kind of show you God doesn't need our money. But then why does God do this in our hearts and our lives? Because obviously there's that selfish inclination that we all have. When we talk about giving around here, it might be mentioned in a sermon here or there. I think last year I preached two sermons on giving. The year before I think I did a series, an actual series. We talked about getting out of debt and those kind of principles on giving. All right. We've done outside the pulpit and just Bible studies, Financial Peace University. And it's just basically talking about how to get your finances in order, and how to operate in a biblical fashion, how to be free from debt and those things. But on the most part, you know, that's not the center of what we teach. But if we're going to be faithful to the Scriptures, and I'm going to be a faithful pastor to you, it's my responsibility. And how in the world, as I said, can you talk about living abundantly and not deal with this particular topic? Because so many people are hurting in this area in their life because they're letting those things manage their life. But what I really want to do is give you three simple points today that I think that will really help us understand why we ought to give. And what, why, what, why that will be a, a righteous motive in our life and how to uh, adjust our hearts so that it is a righteous motive. The Bible says this in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 7. There's a passage here. It's pretty simple. It says, you know, just as you excel in everything else. I didn't have it on the screen. Oh, I'm going to, I got ahead of myself. I'm going to jump for it because y'all don't look at this. I'm going to come back to it. Close your eyes. No. Boop. 
There we go. Just as you excel in everything else, in faith, in speech, all right, in knowledge, and in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you excel also in this grace of giving. Now, break that down just real quick. He says, you guys are doing great. You are excelling in your spiritual walk and life. I mean, you are excelling in your faith. What's that? You're following Jesus. You're committed to Christ. That's awesome. He said, you're excelling in your speech. You're talking about the Lord. What's coming out of your mouth is, is lifting. It's honoring. It's encouraging. It exalts Jesus. It's the gospel. All right? Your speech is excellent. He said, but not only your speech. He says, hey, your knowledge the Bible says grow in grace and in knowledge. Of the Lord. You're grow- How do you get on knowledge? You're in the Word. You're reading the Bible. You're, you're hearing the Bible. You're studying Scripture. And so you're growing in knowledge. All right? He said you're growing this way. But also he says hey, you're growing in complete earnestness. What's that mean? Your love is not phony. You really love each other. There's a, there's a joy in your relationship. There's not a bunch of division. Now, 1 Corinthians, it was a different story. Remember it? First time they came, there was a lot of division, a lot of disunity. They're, they didn't have earnestness in their heart at all, all right? They were just self-seeking. He said, but you have grown in that area. And, and, and then he says, you're excelling in your love for us. You love the pastor. Hey, not a lot of pastors can say that their church actually loves them. <laughs> Don't make me come out there. <laughs> It's pleasant, it's rewarding to have a church, that, to be a part of a church that loves their leadership and loves their pastors. That's a blessing to know that people love their pastors. may not agree with your pastor, but you love him. That's good to know. Now, what's he say? Hey, that's, he said, you guys are doing great things, but I want you to excel in this other thing as well. I want you to excel in what he calls it, the grace of giving. You got to love, not just giving, but your giving is in grace. Your giving is fragrant with grace. Your giving is motivated by grace. You're, and grace is that, it's a power word in the New Testament, in the Greek language. Means there's just something active, powerful in your giving. You need to excel in this area. And he talks in those two chapters about, about what it means to excel. Now, let me back up real quick since you didn't peek. We'll cover it back real quick. There's three areas. This is pretty much the sermon outline for today, all right? The reasons we should give. Break them down one. It's a response for what God has done for me in the past. Number two, it's a response for what God is doing for me right now in the present. But it's also a response of what my expectation is for the future, what God will do for me in the future. Now, I'm not saying amen and dismissing you here. That was just to let you know what I'm preaching on. <laughs> We're going to go a few more minutes here. You still with me? Now, I had some folks get up and walk out this morning in the first service. Y'all going to hang on, right? <laughs> Don't walk out. You'll miss the blessing. Lock in. Now you, I, this, this really may be hard. The first time I heard these truths as a young Christian, they were hard to hear at first. They really were. I, I didn't have much to give to start with. And this, this guy was telling me that I need to give. This preacher was tell, talking to me about the importance of giving in my life and being a tither and being a first fruits giver and talking about the importance of just, you know, that he said, and he, what really ticked me off, he says, That's, if you're a tither, he said, you're just a baby giver. That's smart Ellie. <laughs> Didn't like that at all. You know, wow, that dirt poor. All right? So that, you know, that, there's some things that didn't set me. But when I listened and I paid attention, this was the lesson, this was the message that after I gave my life to Jesus Christ that has transformed me to this day. That has changed. Listen, I, honestly, folks, if I hadn't b- received and believed that lesson, now I'm try- this is not trying to sound arrogant. This is just facts. We wouldn't be sitting in this room today. Because when we started Believer's Fellowship Church, we had nothing. No denomination stood with us. No sister church stood with us. Nobody wanted to hold up a bunch of money and say, you guys go get it. Here, we're going to bankroll you the first year or two. We didn't have all the advantages of so many churches that start across the nation. It just wasn't there. It didn't happen that way. God chose to do it another way. He chose to do it by this faith movement where we just chose to believe God and see what God would do. So, again, that's God we're bragging on. All right? But catch this. Why should I give? Why should it be important to me? What's, why, what, what's my, my, vote, my, my motivation here? All right, he says, I want you to excel in this grace. So giving is what we say first and foremost. It allows me to examine my motivation in the present. Each man, each one must do as he is purposed in his heart. This is a heart issue. Not grudgingly, 
It's not compulsion. God loves cheerful giving. How can I be a cheerful giver? I understand it. I see what God's saying to me. I realize what God's trying to do with me. I begin to understand that by nature, I'm a selfish individual. And so God has these things in my life that he requires of me and expects of me to do so I can keep these things in check. But first and foremost, hey, I have to understand God has done some things for me that are mind-blowing. And God has done some things for you that nobody else could do, that you couldn't do for yourself. God has saved you. God has set you free from the power of sin, death, hell, and the grave. God has made available to you his Holy Spirit and his power in your life. God has made available to you the joy of the Lord. He's made available to you the peace that passes understanding. He's made available to you his love and the ability that comes with that to love others. God has done some awesome things. God has met your need. God has paid your bills. God has provided a way when there seemed to be no way. I mean, do I need to keep going here? All right. God has done some stuff for me. It's mind-blowing to all that the Lord has done for me and all that he's done for you. And we should have this, this, this joy in our heart and this thankfulness in our life to say, you know, God, you've done these things and you just now expect me to give as well. And it's what to do. First and foremost, when I write a check, when I give my money to the Lord, it's an expression for God's blessings upon my life. I can't pay God for what he's done for me, but I sure can express my gratitude. I sure can express my thankfulness. How many of you got kids? How many remember when they were little bitty kids? Maybe you still got some little kids like that. You remember going to the, to the McDonald's or the Sonic? I think I've used this illustration before, but it's so appropriate. You, you go to, the, to, the, you know, to Sonic or to Whataburger or wherever your favorite burger place is, and your kid wants a burger and fries. And so you get him a burger and fries, or you get them a burger and fries, and you sit down at the table with them, and you're just enjoying the time with the family, and then all of a sudden you make the terrible mistake of reaching over and getting one of your children's french fries. <laughs> hey! Those are my fries, Dad. Well, you selfish little twerk. You might not say it out loud, but it's in your mind, right? He didn't pay for the fries. He didn't even pay to get to the fry place. He didn't pay for the clothes to get dressed in so he could go to eat the fries. And it's not that you can't afford fries of your own. You could go and get a full order of fries. If you, you can buy enough fries with the money in your pocket to bury him probably. <laughs> They're not that expensive, right? And so in your mind, you think, that's just ingratitude. No, that's an expression of the selfish nature of every person. So before we reprimand our kids or while we're in the teaching moment, let's remember it with God. When God asks something of us, when God speaks to our heart and moves on our mind and says, I want you to do this, I want you to, or speaks to his words that here's the way you live your life of giving. And we, I don't really want to do that. We forget that everything we have comes from the Lord. We forget that the jewelry hanging on our body, the clothes on our back, the shoes on our feet, the vehicles we drive. You can say all you want to. Well, I worked hard. You wouldn't be able to work hard for if God hadn't blessed you. Amen. And there's a lot of people who understand that in their whole life. The Bible says, you know, the grace of the Lord, that for though he was rich, yet for your sakes, he became poor. Why? So that you could be made rich. You know, Jesus bankrupt himself, literally. He laid aside the wealth of heaven, became a man, took on the form of man, became a servant for man, and gave up himself so that we could be blessed so bountifully. And we'll talk about what that means a little bit more in a, in a moment. We talk about true spiritual wealth, what that really means. But Jesus did this for you. There ought to be some appreciation. I mean, we ought to be emptying our wallets more than, than holding on to them. Amen. And saying, God, how can I give to you when you've given so much to me? I just thank you for the opportunity. I, I, I love what Paul says in these chapters 8 and chapter 9 as he, he goes through these things. Not only said, you know, that, that God has done this, he, he took on poverty so you could have, so you could be blessed. And Jesus goes on another place in Matthew and said, listen, you have freely received. In other words, you didn't pay for anything I've done for you. I have freely given everything to you. Freely you receive, now you freely give it. Without expectation. You know, first and foremost, you just give it out of gratitude. The Apostle Paul says in, 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 in 2 Corinthians 8, he says, I'm not commanding you, but I just want to test the sincerity of your love. I just, you know, it's the thing, put your money where your mouth is. That's a nicer way to say it, I guess. <laughs> this time you prove that you really do love me. How much do you love me? Let me count the ways. 101, 102. <laughs> 
How much do we, if, if my giving expresses how much I love God, then how much am I really saying I love God? That's a powerful thing when you stop and think about it. Well, Brother Joe, I don't give much. Well, what does that say? Maybe that says you don't understand this attitude of appreciation. It's just a simple expression of your love and of your gratitude. And I think it's the Lord who tells us to put our money where our mouth is. I printed this little thing this week called Leftovers. It said, Leftovers are such humble things. We would never serve to a guest. And yet we serve them to the Lord, who deserves the very best. We give to him leftover time, stray minutes here and there. Leftover cash we give to him, such few coins as we can spare. We give our youth to the world, to hatred, to lust, to strife. All but in our declining years, we give to him the remnant of our life. We give God the leftovers all too often, and we just miss the mark. Listen, there, there's no appreciation in leftovers. I mean, some of you may like leftovers. I'm not a big leftover fan. There's just something missing. <laughs> I eat leftovers, but that's not my first choice. So giving allows me to show just how, how, how grateful am I. Second point, we said, that giving is also an expression, not of just what the Lord's, but it's all, what he's done in the past, but it is now expresses my motivation in this present, you know? What's driving? Bible says, seek you first, what? The kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. Why? Why would the Lord tell us to do that? Because we're not naturally do that. It has to be a choice. There has to be a willful, volitional decision on my part saying, I'm going after God, and I'm going after God's will, and I'm going to obey God's ways. So periodically through my life, I need a values checkup, and one of the ways I get it is every, day, every week I have to take a look at what's really important in my life, and especially what's important in regard to my time, my talent, my treasures. How am I spending those? Where am I investing those? Giving is a constant reminder from the Lord that I can express what he, an appreciation for what he's done for me in the past, but also can take a little priority check, a little values check in the present now of what's really important to me. Giving helps me to understand how selfish I can be and to drive me from it. And it sets me free from the power of those things. Deuteronomy 14, 3, there's a passage in there that's talking about tithing. And this is in regard to the law. Understand there is a tithing that's not in regard to the law that was instituted prior to the law. There was an expectation of God's people. And we'll talk about that at another time. But in there it says in Deuteronomy 14, 23, it says that the purpose of tithing is to teach us to put God first. That's the Living Bible Translation, but it's the same thing no matter who you read it. To show who's the real priority in my life. I can say, seek you first the kingdom of God, but what I need to do is to seek first the kingdom of God. And the way how I treat my money shows where my priority are. Do you think God needs my money? No. What he needs is my heart. But if things have my heart, and I'm not willing to deal with that, then he's not going to have my heart. So if I want to commit myself to him, it's those, those important areas of time, talents, and treasures. Matthew 6, 33, let's, let's say it one more time. You know, seek you first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. What are the things? If you read the context, he's talking about the things of your life, the shelter, the food, the clothing, the necessities of life. God says, don't you think I'll take care of you? I'll take care of the birds, <laughs> you know, but, and I'll take care of you. Now, remember Matthew 6, and, you know, 7, and he's talking about there's that great sermon on the mount. But you'll realize as you read through every principle there, there's some aspect of, of you know, it's always God first. He's, he's always first. And to be like him follows. Not just to know about him, but for me to emulate, for me to be like him, for the character of Jesus to be formed in my life, for Jesus to, to work in my life so that I'm maturing in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, so that I'm, I'm growing up in the Lord Jesus Christ. In, for, in 2 Corinthians 8, and that, he continues in verse 5 where he's talking about you know, the Macedonians, he tells how they gave their offering. He says, listen, Corinthians, the Macedonians, they gave, not as we hoped. Here's the way they gave. They gave themselves first to the Lord and, and then into the will of God. He sent them. These people came first on surrender to the Lordship of Christ over their life, and then they did what God wanted them to do in their giving. That's what we ask in offerings when we take special offerings. Get right with the Lord, get your heart right with God, and see what God wants you to do. Because this issue of stewardship is always a matter of lordship. Is Jesus really the Lord of my life, or am I still in control? And what better way, in a material, physical way, to check that than to look at where we're at with, with our finances and where we're at with our money? It's all about honoring God with our life. In Proverbs 19, there's a lot of Proverbs that talk about giving and how God honors it. Uh, uh, let me go back to this one, though. If you're not faithful with money, God will not trust you with what? 
Now, I will not trust you with what? True, or what are true spiritual riches? That's what I want. The power of God on my life, the peace of God on my life, the joy of the Lord in my life, the fellowship with God and and Jesus and the Holy Spirit in my life, you know, the the peace that passes all understanding the Scripture talks about, the abundant life. That's, I don't know about you, that's what I want for my life. And I think every Christian, their heart of hearts, that's what they really desire for their life. But he's saying to you, there's something in the way of that. If I can't trust you with this, how can I trust you with that? It's the same things we teach our kids. You know, you don't trust me. You've been lying about this and not being honest about this. How can I trust you with a greater responsibility? Right? It's the same in the Lord dealing with us. If he can't trust us, he calls it unrighteous mammon. All right? Things is the idea here. Money, stuff. God said, I put stuff in your hands. And you don't handle it right. How can I put the real stuff in your hands? The stuff that means something, the stuff that's valuable in life, the, the stuff that gives meaning to life. I mean, there's a lot of millionaires and billionaires in this world, and they're miserable people because they don't possess true spiritual values. Their lives are shattered. Their families are shattered. There's no joy in their heart. There's no joy in their life, no purpose in their living. And they don't enjoy what God has for them because they're not seeking God's kingdom first and his righteousness. So giving allows us for the past, our motives in the present, but also God takes us and looks at our expectations for the future. See the tri-focused activity, how it works here? I said, I'm appreciative. That's the past. It allows me to keep a check on where I am right now today. Am I being self-driven or am I letting the Holy Spirit run my life? Is it all about me and what I can get, what I can have, and I can get more, or am I really letting God be God in my life? The third part of that is, and this is where God really changed Kathy's and I's life in our early marriage. When we began to understand this part about expectations of the future, and he uses, you know, the illustration of a farmer there, all right? And the analogy of a farmer, he goes right into that in chapter 9 when he's talking to the church in, verse, in chapter 9. He says, listen, if you sow sparingly, so about your giving, then you're going to reap sparingly. But if you sow bountifully, you can reap bountifully. He said, he said it has to do with an expectation. What are your needs going to be? There are times we knew that we had big needs going to be coming up around the corner. and How were we ever going to meet those needs? And our plan was pretty simple. Let's start giving as the Lord directs us in our giving, and God's going to meet us in the future with it. And this is talks about, he's talking about proportional giving here. All right, right? A little bit, a lot. You see that? In other words, if you, if you give with a teaspoon, you get a tablespoon back. You give with a shovel, you get a boatload back, truckload back. The more you invest, the more returns. The little you invest, the little you return is. Well, I don't know about you, but my needs are going to be great in the future. Amen. I don't know that they've ever decreased. <laughs> Seems like next year I need more than I needed this year, and the next year I need more than I need the year before. And then you hit those retirement years. All right? Maybe you're in those retirement years, and now you see just how much you really need the Lord because Uncle Sam ain't cutting it. He's been robbing from you. That's another story. <laughs> we'll cover how they ripped you off of all your Social Security later. <laughs> but what he's saying, God's saying, I'll take care of you, but you have to trust me. And he used the analogy of, he said, you're going to put seed down. And if you follow the whole chapter, <coughs> excuse me, he talks about the sower that goes out and puts down little seed versus the, the, the farmer, the sower that goes out and puts down a lot of seed. Here's the thing about it. If you follow the story, he says, God gives you the seed for the sowing. So you take what God's given you, and you be faithful with it. How big a crop? What's the return you're, you're interested in here? If you give a little, you get a little. That's just the principle of God. Given it shall be given to you. Press down, shaking together, running over. But what if you give more? What if you give more than, say, the 10%, a requirement? What if you're willing to give 20%, 30%? What happens then? You reap a little, you get a little. You sow a little, sow a lot, <coughs> you're going to get a lot. So the important principle is this, what am I expecting? This deals with faith, all right? But you have to realize, who are we giving to? Well, I, I have people come to me, and, and, and this happens at both churches sometimes. <coughs> Excuse me, I'll get rid of that in a second. And they come up to me, and they, and they hand me their tithe check or something. And they say, this is for you. I said, was well, my name on it? No, it's the church's name. I said, well, you make it out to me if it's for me. 
<coughs> I understand. I'm just teasing him, right? I understand what they're trying to say here. You know, they're trying to say we're giving it to the church. But, hey, we're the church. Amen. All right? We're giving it to the Lord. And if you, give it to, if you give it to me, I might not give you much back, if any. <laughs> I told you we could be selfish, didn't I? But when we give it to the Lord, he's not selfish. Amen. He'll honor what we do. And this, again, is a common principle throughout scriptures because it's talking about who we give to. In Proverbs, here's the verse one about one who is gracious to a poor man lends to who? The Lord. And he'll repay him. Another translation puts it this way. When you give to the poor, it's like lending to the Lord. And he repays wonderful interest on the loan. Amen. Can't loan it to the poor man, he can't pay you back. So who am I giving it to? I'm giving it to the Lord. There's been often times God's told me to give to poor people. There's times that God gives me, you know, some of my, just as an example, in my, in my own family, all right, we give to the church. That's our main distribution center. But it's not the only one. But our majority of our giving goes into our church fellowship. But then we do have other needs that we're aware of and other people and other families and things that God wants us to do or God wants us to be a blessing to someone. And as we do that, and God blesses me. Not too long ago, uh, my wife and I were sitting at lunch with my son and my daughter-in-law, and we decided we'd pay for somebody's lunch across the room. All right? You know what happened? I'm checking. I said, where's my bill? And they paid, I paid the bill, the bill, made the credit card, and tipped the guy for him. He said, well, your bill's already been taken care of. I'm thinking, that's a good deal. <laughs> they were two. We are four. Amen? Amen? That's a good deal, is it not? Yeah. You'll never know it if you don't try it, by the way. It doesn't have to be my meal you're paying for, okay? Anybody's meal. Be a blessing. You may see somebody in need over there. And I know many of you do this. You've seen what I'm talking about. This is nothing new. But for those that are kind of stuck in that old flesh world in life, it's time to break out into a bigger world of being used by God and being a blessing. But here's the thing about it. The more you choose to be used by God, the more God blesses you. Amen. We've heard a thousand times, you can't outgive God. It's just not going to happen. So there's this appreciation expectation. Malachi talks about that storehouse giving, bringing all the tithes into the storehouse. Now, for those of you who are kind of stuck in, in covenant relationships here, some of you say, well, that tithing is the Old Testament. Well, tithing you introduced in the Old Testament, and I'll tell you that. And you say, well, well tithing is under the law. Well, not the first tithe is not, all right? In fact, if you follow the Old Testament law tithing, you're giving about 33 and a third percent of your income to the temple, all right? It pays for the Levites. It paid to support the poor. It paid for the feast of tabernacles, the, the, the unleavened bread, and all the, the seven feasts were covered by those expenses of the tithe. But there was always a tithe in place of what we call first fruit. Remember Cain and Abel, they brought first fruits to the Lord. And, and we'll talk about that some of the time. But the idea is there's always been this principle that Adam and Eve must have known because Cain and Abel were aware of it, of making offerings to the Lord. Why? To show our, express, our appreciation for what the Lord has done for us to be in, keep, keep my motivations in check in the present and to show my expectations that I am trusting God to meet my needs in the future. Amen. And so there's this element here where God says, but here's the beauty of this is do this and see what I will do. In fact, this is the only place in Scripture where God says we can test him. Amen. In fact, it's like I dare you is what it's, it reads. Anybody willing to take up on the dare? I dare you to do this. I tell you, some of you have kind of gotten probably in the habit of giving it your lifestyle now. It's a discipline life. And maybe you've quit realizing all the bountiful, the bountiful blessings because you're just used to it. It's time to realize that we are where we are because God got us here. And we've been faithful. And he has been incredibly faithful. Amen? To remember you are. Because sometimes you might think, well, maybe I'll stop doing that. I mean, I could use that another 20, 30% of my income by not giving it to the Lord. Amen? No, I couldn't. And neither can you. You can't afford to stop because you don't want this happening. Heaven's windows are shut. Floodgates stop. You know, the doors are closed. He talks about rebuking the devourer in that passage. Satan loosed on your finances. Things fall apart in your life. Been there, done that. <laughs> not, a, not a popular place for any of us to live. But God always pays. God says, you give a cup of cold water in my name, I'll repay you. God says, you give to me, I'll lay up those treasures in heaven. So not only be blessed now, you'll be blessed in eternity. In fact, the more you give to me, God says, the more I'll bless you. You can't outgive me. Give and it shall be given unto you. Is, this, is, this is the lesson we learned, though. When we were young believers starting our marriages, we realized being as dirt poor as we were, 
The best way we could see God move in our life was to begin to be faithful with what we had and just to give graciously and bountifully from where we are. Because we knew we were going to have needs down here. Well, how are those needs going to be met? Because we're being faithful here. Then we knew there was going to be a need that would be out of our ability to pay, perhaps, or to meet because some requirement was upon us. But we knew if we'd be faithful here, God meets. We knew in starting the ministries that God called us to start, in evangelism and the street ministries and the things that we did with working with young people across the country, that would require a lot of money. It would require a lot of money. And if God didn't come through, we're going to be busted. So how are we going to keep the pipeline open, the windows of heaven? We keep giving. Amen. And as we keep giving, God kept giving to us. Amen. And it just, it's, 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 way, it's the way we live a life now. It shows we appreciate the, what the Lord's done. It shows that we, our motives are in order and in place for right now. But also says we're trusting God for tomorrow. Amen. And we're believing God. And this is the way we're expressing our belief because we grew up understanding faith without works is dead. And there's a lot of people who have no living faith when it comes to this particular area. I mean, look at Luke 6, 38. One more time I'll say, give, and it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together. It'll be given, they'll be poured into your lap with good measure. Running over. He said, by the standard of measure, there it is, that proportional stuff again. Give a little, get a lot. Give a little, give, get a little more. Or give a lot. It'll be measured to you in return. Now, who said that? The Baptist preacher talking about giving to the offerings? No. The prosperity preacher on the radio, I'm sure he used it, but that's, well, let's say who said it to start with. Jesus. Your Lord and Savior, who died for you and rose from the dead that you might be saved. That same Jesus said, now, does anybody think this is not a command or an option? This is a command, but it's also a promise, right? It's a command, give, with a promise, you'll receive. If you get that down today, if that's all you walk out with, you've come a long way, baby, because that's where God's going to bring life and grace and blessing to your life, to your future. This is the principle you teach your kids. This is the principle you live by. This is the principle you teach your grandkids. You want them to learn this principle. Now, I didn't learn it as a boy growing up in church much. Because pastors didn't talk about money any more than they talked about sex, all right? Those were just taboo. <laughs> and look where we are as a culture. We have people that don't know how to give, people that are stingy, people that are, that are self-absorbed and they're missing what God has done. God is saying, give and it will be given unto you. Listen, in essence, it's, it's pretty simple. I'll be trustworthy with what God gives me, right? Now, you may be thinking, well, Brother Joe, you know, I just really have a hard time. <clears throat> Things are bad. You know, the economy may be looking a little better, but I just don't know. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, I'm just not the kind of person that, uh, you know, I just uh, I can't make financial commitments. You make so many financial commitments all the time. You went out and bought a house. You might have paid $200,000, $250,000 for that house, maybe a little less, maybe a little more. You signed a note for 30 years. That's a lifetime. By the time you pay that house off, you pay close to a million dollars. <laughs> Don't tell me you can't make financial commitments. That's with no return except what equity or great investment. Not according to what I put into it. Not in the long run of 30 years. You think that's such a good deal? Could put that money in the bank, made a whole lot more money. You see what I'm saying? Oh, I can't make any financial commitments. You went out and you bought a car. You signed a note for five, six, seven years now. You can sign a note on a car. You keep that commitment every month. You pay that car down. You got credit cards in your pocket, right? That credit card represents a financial commitment. Now, of all the financial commitments you can make, the one that's really going to pay you back is what you give in eternity and what you give to God and what God honors you with. That's the way you'll make it in life, and that's what will get you through in life. There's two kinds of giving in life. We're just about done. There's giving by reason, giving by revelation. Giving by reason means I go to the church, I give a little money, I pop something in the offering, you know, just what I think I can do. I can give 10, I can give 100, you know, or I can give 50 bucks, whatever I think I can do. And it's not based upon anything other than just logic and reason. 
The Bible really doesn't, that kind of falls, if the Bible does talk about in that giving a little bit to get a little bit. And then there's giving by revelation. Revelation says, what does the scriptures teach? You know, and by the way, isn't that the bottom line for your life? What, what does the Bible teach? What is the Bible? And can I get a witness on that? What does the Bible say? Because that's where we go. And the Bible teaches, he, the Bible teaches how to give. And then it tells us to give. And it tells us that God rewards, and he does. I mean, this, this is something you can track financially, and you can see the blessings of God. You can, you can, you can work this out with Quicken, all right? <laughs> you can see how God blesses you with income and expenses if you're being faithful. So you can see, there's a track record that you can trace and see. And God says, I'll do this in your life. But what happens? You're given by revelation, the revelation of the Word, but also that revelation of the prompting of the Holy Spirit. There are times the Holy Spirit might prompt you about giving to that person or this person or that need or that situation. And maybe nobody else knows about it, but God knows about that, and you do it faithfully. You're giving as the Lord guides you. It starts with giving what we know is commanded from Scripture, the revelation of God's Word and His will, right? And the Bible talks about first fruits long before the law. Thought, That's the law. I'm under grace. Well, let's just use that principle for it. Grace says everything. Follow the first century church. They just, they just gave it all to each other. Right? Gave it to the Lord. They sold stuff, sold properties, everything. They had something in common. But obviously, if you follow the theme and the context of the Word of God, there is proportional giving. First fruits. Comes off the top, not the bottom. Comes off the best, not the worst, not the least. It's giving by revelation, the Lord's direction in your life. And as you do that, that's how God, that's when God begins to move and honor in your life. Some of you are old in this room. I'm just looking around and taking note of that because I'm old, so I know old real well. But you guys that are older, y'all remember, was it, what's his name? Benny, uh, what was the comedian? Jack Benny. Jack Benny, yeah, not trying to say Benny Hill. No, not him, Lord. Uh, <laughs> Jack Benny. Remember Jack Benny? His, his stick, so to say, he was a tightwad. Have y'all heard Jack Benny? Yeah. You go back on YouTube, Jack Benny. Hilarious. His timing's impeccable. His funniest one. You know, straight face, tightwad. Most of his gimmick and skit and his comedy routines just about being a big tightwad. You know, but he's hilarious. He did this one deal where he says, a guy came up to me today and stuck a gun in my back and said, I demand your life or your money. Jack just kind of shaking a little bit. And said, so Robert said again, your life or your money. Again, Tell you, buddy, it's going to cost you your life or give me your money. What is it? After three or four times, Benny just shakes out. Just wait a minute. I'm trying to think. <laughs> money was more important than his life. I think a lot of people like that, right? They're, they're so invested in what they're invested in in their own life and their own ways that they completely mix, miss the mark. You know, God's, God's called us to give, and he never tells us to, to give without telling us how to do something. He never tells us to do anything without telling us how to do it. You know? And if you follow the scripture of 1 Corinthians, he says, he talks about the collection of the saints. He said, listen, here's how you do it. The first day of every week, set aside some of money and keep me to your income. And, and you bring that as the offering. All right? And how does that work? There's a couple of things come out of that. One, it's, that these care, one, it's regular. It's the first day of every week. We give every Sunday at our house. All right? We don't get paid every week, but we give every week. All right? We give every, every week. That's just a, it's a good guideline. It should be planned. You set aside a sum. How much? Well, have you been blessed? How has God blessed you? Then you be faithful to the Lord. This is the grace of God, and this is the grace of giving. It's, it's more simple than what we really. So what are the three bi bi biblical reasons we gave you that we should give? One, it shows appreciation for what done is, God has done for me in the past. And he has certainly blessed you. And he has certainly blessed me. But also, it's a response to what God is doing right now. It keeps my motives in check. And also, a response to what God is going to do in the future. What am I believing God for? Where is faith in my life? The just shall live by faith. Faith without works is dead. God honors faith. Am I going to be a faithful person? Be faithful in my life and faithful in my giving. You know, history, you've read the history concerning Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great conquered the known world. That's why they call him the Great. I don't know if he called himself that or if others called him that. But basically he had everything. He owned the known world at that time, as far as a man's concerned. But Alexander the Great had asked those as he got close to death. He said, when my body is prepared for a funeral and laid in state for people to come by and see his body, you know. When my body is laid in state, instead of taking my arms and crossing them this way, 
I want you to raise my arms up like this with my palms empty and to the sky. He said, because even though I have everything in this life, people need to know that when you leave here, you leave here with nothing. Amen. Amen. Naked I came in, naked I'll go out. Amen. Didn't come in with a wallet attached to me anywhere. Not going one, going out. Amen. But here's the beauty if you're a Christian. What you do here is invested in eternity as well as blessed in the present. It's eternal as well as temporal. God takes care of you. I hate to say it this way. It don't get no better than that. <laughs> Nobody makes that deal or can honor that deal but God. So be faithful to him. Appreciate what he's done for you. Do you express it? Let your giving weekly be that motivated and reminded that Jesus is the Lord of my life, not stuff. You can't love God in money. And that what I'm doing, I'm doing for the kingdom of heaven and for eternity and for tomorrow. God will meet me in the days ahead. Because I believe, given it shall be given. Amen? Amen? Let's stand with our heads bowed. I went about 10 minutes longer than I would normally do, but I think it's an important message for us to understand, especially in the context of the theme of what we're talking about, learning how to thrive in our life, learning how to be abundant in our life, and how to have abundant living in our life. So I encourage you today to examine your own heart and your own life. It could be very clearly in your life that you hadn't been faithful in this area. Well, the way to repent, so to say, one is to confess it to the Lord, and two is to begin to honor the Lord with what he's blessed you with. Learn how to be a giver beyond just a portion of just what we know would be required of us. Learn how to have the abundant giving because in abundant giving comes abundant living. Be that person. Be that person who makes a difference. Of all the people that are honored and memorialized in the world in a righteous way, nobody's ever honored for what they kept. They're honored for what they give. Amen. Let's remember that in our hearts and in our lives. Maybe you're here today and you've never even given the most important thing. That's your heart to the Lord. I'll be standing here at the front. There'll be others who'll be standing here with us. And I want to encourage you to say, listen to either one of us. I today am giving my heart and my life to Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. That'll be the first and greatest step you'll ever make in your life. And then you'll find a natural flow of your life to be a giver in your life. Come, trust the Lord Jesus with your life. He is trustworthy. Surrender to him. Make a decision today that'll turn your life around forever. Every sin will be forgiven. The debt of sin will be paid for by Jesus. He died on the cross to pay for it. And you'll have a new life in Jesus Christ. Maybe there's some other area in your life that you need to come between you and the Lord Jesus to put on the altar. God has a way. I, I've seen people come to know Christ. In times we spoke about money, they come to know Jesus Christ because God was dealing with their heart about something else. And all that other stuff was just another sign that they were going the wrong direction with their life. But whatever is on your heart need, we're here to pray for you today. Maybe you pray for a need and help in your life or just to come by yourself and pray. Let's, let's turn this time over to the Lord. Let him lead us and let him guide us. Father, in Jesus' name, as we come to this time of invitation and your Holy Spirit's inviting us, may we not be consumed with our own self or pride or what people think, but let us have humble hearts that are submitted and surrendered to you today. In Jesus' name, you come. Let's trust the Lord today as we worship together. When the music fades And all this stripped away and I simply come Longing just to bring Something that's of worth That will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the all 
about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it. But it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. encourage you that right where you're standing, whatever the Lord has spoken to you about, isn't that topic of the message even? If it is, praise the Lord, speak to Him and surrender to Him. But whatever it is that you're giving over to the Lord, I want you to know He's trustworthy. You can lay it in His hands. He's faithful. And I, you know, I know sometimes fears and doubts, and worries, all those things flood our heart and mind. But you can trust the Lord. So just lay it in his lap today. He knows every part of it. Father, we love you today and we thank you. And our heart is towards you. We thank you, as we said in this message even, for everything you have done for us. What a wonderful Savior. What a great Father you are to us. And Father, you've required of us, Lord, faithfulness to you. So Lord, areas that need to be directed or corrected or instructed or strengthened in our life. God, we avail those to you in this moment and trust you for your grace in these moments. Our hearts are truly yours. Thank you, Lord, for this church, for this fellowship, for the truth that we get to hear and to be a part of and to share with each other. We love you. We give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I was thinking on the way over here, Kathy, in fact, now we've been talking about it some last night when we first started the church about all the acts of giving that were expressed to even get started and start moving in this direction. Early on, within the first year, we were taking a, uh, a building fund offering. We were meeting in a hotel and from there to a school, but that first year after we were in, Pansy remembers this as well. She was there and others who were part of those early days, you'll remember this, but uh, we started taking up, I think we'd gotten together fifteen, twenty, thirty thousand dollars like that after the first year and a half, over and above tithes and offering, just towards getting us a place, you know, a place we could meet. And then all of a sudden, there was a single mom in our church who had a daughter that needed a lung transplant. And uh, as we were praying, trying to work out a way that we could do some charitable things and have concerts, whatever it is, to help raise funds for this as a church body. The Lord just instructed my heart to go to the leaders of the church and mention to them, hey, we've got this sum of money here that could help tremendously. It's not going to cover everything. And I just recommend that we give it all. And we did, praise the Lord. You're probably familiar with this story, aren't you, Dennis? <laughs> 
It was Tysa Long. God gave her another 20-some-odd years when they weren't expecting hardly any time at all. But here we are, setting on several million dollars worth of property at two locations, probably close to $10 million in property values, debt-free today. Do I believe that God had anything to do with that? Amen. That's just a simple illustration if we're willing just to make a sacrifice in our lives. And there's times God calls us to put more on the altar than what we want to at times. But God never is unfaithful. Just remember that. He's always faithful. Amen? I've seen it over and over. Let's continue to be faithful to the Lord. Hallelujah. We have a baptism, right? Are we ready up there? There you go. Amen. We got Vivian coming down today. She has a unique story. She's been a follower of Christ for a while and finally decided to come today to make that public profession of faith. Amen. So this is Miss Vivian, and she has a couple of words to say. It is a little warm. It's okay. Hi. Sorry, I'm kind of nervous. Um, well, I do want to thank God for bringing me here today. And um, I want to thank him for my husband. We've been married 47 years. Amen. And uh, I want to thank him for my friend, Liz Searcy. I think you all know her. Um, she was obedient to God and prompted me to be baptized. Um, I became a Christian over 30 years ago and thought about baptism, but never really followed up on it. And I thought, well, I was baptized as a baby. But Liz told me to read John chapter 3 about Nicodemus and, and God told him about being born again and baptized, born of the water and the flesh. And then at a prayer time, um, there was a sheet of paper where verses on it and it, he brought my attention to Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 10 and it talked about obedience and it said, repent and be baptized. And I got to thinking even Jesus was baptized. And if he got baptized, I need to follow him. And, and that's what I want to do. So I'm trying to follow him and be obedient. So here I am today and giving God all the glory and um, thanking him for being patient with me and, and loving me and waiting on me, giving me the free will to make this decision. Amen. 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 Do I step down? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Miss Viv, on your public profession of faith, I now baptize you, my sister, in Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Praise God. Amen. Amen. What a joy in the Lord. Amen. To be able to baptize. The water is warm, and there's plenty of water. Anybody else want to come up? We got time. <laughs> Amen. If you have not yet been baptized or you don't have a relationship with Christ, it's, it's not too late. Amen. Talk to somebody. Come to one of the, the, the elders or the deacons or the pastor and, and, and share your story. Amen. Amen. Just a couple of closing announcements. Miss Tammy's supposed to come up and make it. Yep, there she is right there. Y'all give her a round of applause. She's done a great job with the women's ministry. She just, she does everything right. While she's getting ready, uh, your contribution statements, they have either been distributed or will be mailed out. And so be look, if you have moved, make sure that we have your correct address. Uh, but the remain, I think there's like 10 or 11 uh, contribution statements left and they, those will be mail, mailed out. Um, don't forget... Oh, she's ready? Okay. okay. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Laurel asked me to come up today and talk to you about the mentoring program that we have. We have an orientation coming up February 4th, and it's not a commitment. It's just an opportunity to get to know about the program and then make a commitment. So I wanted to read for you just briefly a definition of mentoring. Mentoring is most often defined as a relationship in which an experienced person, the mentor, comes alongside the mentee in developing skills and knowledge 
that will enhance the less experienced person's growth. But I can tell you from being a mentor that both people grow. It's not a one-sided relationship. Amen. Amen. That's right, Sister Margaret. Amen. <laughs> so um, who should attend? I made a few notes, and I just want to talk about them because I always forget when I get up there. I get so nervous. If you're struggling in an area in your life, and it's been right here for a long time, it could be loneliness. It could be forgiveness. You haven't forgiven somebody. If you just want to grow, you want to be discipled, then I suggest you go to the orientation. If you feel a calling in here to come alongside a sister in Christ who's going through something, who's struggling, who needs a friend, maybe just somebody to listen to her, if you're feeling that, then I suggest you come to the orientation. And then if you feel a burden in here to pray for others in these type situations, then I suggest you come. As a mentor and a prayer warrior in the ministry, I can tell you that this is a unique journey. Each time it's a unique journey. I don't care how many times you're a mentee or a mentor or a prayer warrior, it's a unique journey. And God has a plan for each one of your lives because each one of you is unique. Now, I see a few mentoring ladies out here. Would you stand up if you've been in the mentoring program? That is amazing. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Would you trade it for anything? I agree. So one thing I want to say is just the last thing is if you've ever been in the mentoring program, Laurel has what we call a life verse. And so if you know it, just repeat it with me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Ladies, let God direct your path. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Just wanted to uh, follow up on our Lift Leader Conference. We had a great time. Just thank you so much for your prayers uh, as we went Friday night and, and re- went to uh, Houston's First Baptist. We started about 5.30 and we ended right about 12 o'clock, 12.30. And it was just a great time. We had three sessions. Well, there was multiple sessions, but everybody was able to go to three sessions. And just a great time of learning and, and, bring, and being able to bring that information back. And, and so uh, if you're not in Lift, get in Lift. Know that your lift leaders are excited and are praying for you. We have about 50% of our church that is currently in a lift. So the other 50%, and I'm not going to call you out this week, but maybe next week, make sure that you're in a lift group. And that kind of lends this, lends itself to the next uh, announcement. Next week, we are having a Super Bowl tailgating party, and it's not an outreach as much as, as it is an inreach. And so it's an opportunity for you and for everybody to come. About 4 o'clock, 4.30, we're going to have grills and, and, and barbecue pits set up to eat, fellowship, do a lift lesson, and then come in here and watch the Super, the Super Bowl if you want to, or just continue to fellowship. So if you're in a lift, if you're not in a lift, if you're here today, come next week about 4.30. Just again, a great time of fellowship. Get to eat, hang out, and then do a lift study and then watch the Super Bowl. So start just thinking about making plans to come for that. The lift leaders are excited about this opportunity. I'm excited about the opportunity and how Lord will move in your life. Uh, Ch- chili cook-off meeting immediately following the service today. Next, or this coming up Friday, February 1st, 7 o'clock, men's dinner. Curtis Brown, who, who spoke at the Magnolia uh, campus at their previous men's dinner, uh, he's going to share his message with us here. Uh, we are getting ready to submit our order for food. So if you have not signed up, sign up. It'll be a great time of fellowship, but also more importantly, a great time uh, to be able to hear God's word and how uh, God continue, continue to move in Curtis's life and continue to move, move in your life. Wednesday night, we're continuing our, our, book st- our uh, Bible study on Romans. Be sure to be here. Just a great time of fellowship and, and, and really unpacking Romans. Lastly, your tithes and offerings. We don't pass a, pass a plate around here. Uh, we do have offering receptacles in the back. And if I could take another minute of your time before I dismiss you, uh, I too struggled with giving a long time ago. And I remember a Wednesday night, we were, we were still upstairs on Wednesday night and, and my finances maybe weren't where I needed them to be. And I remember talking to Pastor Joe and I said, he said, how are you doing? I said, I'm not well. You know, I just my finances just aren't where they need to be. He was like, well, give more. I was like, who is this guy telling me to give more? But you know what? I never, for, I never forgot that because it pierced my heart. 
I talked to Sophia that night, and we ended up giving more, and I tell you what, we haven't looked back. And so just a great message and a great reminder. And so uh, give because it was given to you, amen? It's not ours. It's his. He's just trusting us with it, amen? So give it your... The, your Give of your first fruits, amen. If you're on Facebook, thank you so much for joining us. Remember to click on that give button on our, on our website to make sure that you can uh, also give your offerings. Uh, don't forget, tonight is family night, but five o'clock. Uh, if, you're, if you don't have plans and you shouldn't have plans other than to go to uh, Iglesia Bautista, the, the Good Pastor Baptist Church. Uh, <laughs> it's at five o'clock in Katy. Uh, Pastor Joe's got a great message to, to, to give, and, and so just be there to support him. Amen. With that being said, any other announcements? You are dismissed.